Welcome to the speaking section of the IELTS exam. My name is Adrian. I will be your examiner for this part of the test. We are recording this for clerical purposes. The speaking has three parts. I will give you instructions for each. Before we continue, may I see your identification? Yep, sure. Here it is. Please have a look. And what is your full name? Um, my name is Orhan Sainli. You can call me just Orhan. Okay, Orhan. We are currently conducting this exam in Ankara, Turkey. The time right now is 14 o'clock. Let's begin. For part one, I will ask you a couple of questions to get to know you better and some questions on a general topic. Where do you live? Um, currently, I'm living in Baku, which is the capital city of Azerbaijan, but I'm planning to move to Istanbul, Turkey in a year or two. Um, it's just my childhood dream to live there, and I also want to help people there become effective speakers of English by teaching them IELTS. And what do you like to do in your spare time? Well, um, when I have some free time, I like to engage in some uh, recreational activities, such as playing soccer and PlayStation. I also like to uh, spend some quality time with um, family members at home or um, dine out at restaurants. Let's talk about artificial intelligence or AI. What is your understanding of artificial intelligence? Well, uh, I think AI makes life easier despite certain concerns for its ability to cause unemployment and possibly take over the human race. Simply, it is a machine replicating human thought and decision making. Can you name a few gadgets or tools that you use daily which incorporate AI technology? I use uh, my laptop and smartphone to access artificial intelligence programs such as Coolbot and ChatGPT, which help me score an overall 8.5 on my IELTS exam by fixing my grammar mistakes and offering alternative vocabulary and grammar structures. How do you think artificial intelligence has impacted your daily life? Well, like I just said, it has helped me immensely in tackling my IELTS exam. Um, I constantly ask ChatGPT if it was okay to use a certain phrase or idiom, and it prevents me from uh, including unnatural expressions into my speech, such as unwind myself. Do you think artificial intelligence can play a significant role in education? Why or why not? I believe it can. I see AI as a teacher with unlimited patience and vast knowledge who can answer almost any question, making it ideal for students who are constantly eager to learn more. Um, it is available when a human teacher is not. Again, just take my case of IELTS preparation. How do you feel about AI in the workplace? Uh, I believe it can enhance productivity if used efficiently, allowing employees to meet their deadlines and achieve their targets more easily. Uh, online grammar checkers, such as Coolbot and Grammarly, help people save time uh, by automatically correcting their mistakes in their professional emails. I know uh, because I use these myself. Do you believe artificial intelligence could ever fully replace human intelligence? Not really, no. I believe it could 
rival and even outperform human intelligence in some areas, but uh, doing so completely is no walk in the park. Um, I just can't envision a robot preaching religion or conducting politics as this takes a certain level of contextual perception that cannot be achieved by a machine. What are your thoughts on the ethical implications of developing and using AI? Um, I think restrictions should be placed on the use of AI uh, because it can become a deadly machine if used for re evil reasons. Um, already, many people are using AI in questionable ways to flood the internet with low-quality content to build search engine optimization. Are there any advancements in AI you are looking forward to or concerned about? Actually, I'm not very concerned about its potential, but I'd like to see AI offer medical help and even perform surgeries, given the global shortage of qualified physicians. Um, I believe it could easily raise people's overall life expectancy, especially with routine interventions like appendectomy. How do you envision the future of artificial intelligence and its impact on society? Um, I think it will make people lazier and less physically active. No doubt about that. Just imagine having a robot carry out daily chores for, such as cleaning the house uh, and grocery shopping. I think it's something to worry about. On the other hand, it will continue to increase productivity and development. Have you ever used any devices or services powered by artificial intelligence? Uh, yeah, like I said, uh, I use Coolbot and ChatGPT on a daily basis uh, to improve my linguistic abilities and overall knowledge. If you could change AI in some way, what would you do and why? Uh, given the chance, I would enhance AI to be more representative of human individuality and to be naturally erroneous. Uh, AI actually seems weird because it's too stereotypical and unnaturally perfect. That is the end of part one. We will now continue with part two for this part. I will show you some questions. You will see it on your screen in just a moment. You will have one minute to read these questions. Think about your answers. You can take notes in this one minute time if you wish. You have some paper and your pencil in front of you. And then you will have one to two minutes to speak. I will tell you when to start and when to stop. Is that clear? Yes, that is. Talk about a city you have recently visited. Your one minute preparation time begins now. Okay. Orca, and your one minute preparation time is up. Please begin speaking. Um, in March of last year, I got the opportunity to jet off to Istanbul, Turkey on my spring vacation. Actually, when my cousin offered me to join him on a trip to that city, I jumped at the chance believing that I would have so much fun, which I did. Uh, Istanbul. What a wonderful city. Even Ankara, the country's capital, pales in comparison to its beauty and historical significance. Istanbul is the most populated city in Turkey, and it has a population of 16 million. It has dozens of historic buildings and monuments of the Byzantine Empire in other eras. Noteworthy landmarks are like the Hagia Sophia, Galata Tower and Levant Business District. For my accommodation, I chose a cozy hotel that provided easy access to the city's most famous uh, tourist attractions. Uh, 
as I arrived, I couldn't help but feel a bit of jet lag, but the excitement of exploring this historic destination quickly overcame it. The primary reason for my expedition was to see the uh, historical landmarks and spots where my favorite TV series, The Valley of Wu's, was filmed. Um, walking in the same places as the characters from the show was a surreal experience. Additionally, I wanted to immerse myself in the rich culture of Istanbul, um, from savoring local cuisine to collecting unique souvenirs from the bustling bazaars. Uh, my days were filled with uh, sightseeing, capturing memories at iconic landmarks such as the Hagia Sophia and uh, Sultan Ahmed Mosque. I even ventured off the beaten path exploring some hidden gems that made the journey even more special. Given the chance, I would improve the public transport of Istanbul, as found it a bit slow at times. Uh, but Istanbul has reignited my wanderlust, and I'm definitely eager to explore other new places around Turkey. Okay, your time is up. I will stop you there. Please put the notepaper to the side, turn it over, the pencil as well. Now we will continue with part three. For this part, I will ask you questions related to the topic of part two. Let's talk a bit more about uh, visiting other cities. How do cities benefit from tourism and what measures should they take to ensure that tourism does not negatively impact their local residents? Um, tourism gives benefits to cities through economic growth, job creation, and infrastructure development. It generates revenues from accommodations, dining and attractions, diversifying the local economy, and encouraging investment in public facilities. To prevent ne negative impacts on residents, cities should engage communities in decision making, uh, regulate and plan for responsible tourism development and manage infrastructure effectively. In what ways do you think modern cities differ from those in the past? I mean, particularly in terms of um, architectural design and public spaces. Um, modern cities vary from old cities in architecture in public areas due to technological advances and changing societal needs. Today's buildings often prioritize functionality and sustainability using uh, innovative materials uh, and deviating from traditional styles. Skyscrapers and mixtures developments are prevalent, emphasizing uh, efficient land use. Can you discuss the importance of public transportation in enhancing a city's livability and attractiveness to tourists? I think public transportation plays a crucial role in making a city more livable and appealing to visitors. Firstly, efficient public transit reduces traffic congestion, contributing to cleaner air um, and a more sustainable urban environment. Secondly, it provides cost-effective and convenient mobility options for both residents and uh, visitors, making it easier for tourists to uh, travel the city without the hassle of private transportation. Good. How significant is the role of cultural festivals and events in promoting a city as a uh, tourist destination? Local celebrations and events play a significant role in advertising a city as a tourist destination. Uh, they showcase the unique uh, cultural identity of a city, attracting tourists interested in experiencing more authentic and diverse traditions. The Tulip Festival and Akbank Jazz Festival draw large crowds. I was fortunate enough to see a jazz concert at the time I was there.
What strategies can cities employ to maintain a balance between preserving historical landmarks and accommodating modern development? Cities could employ a variety of approaches to find the harmony between historical landmarks and modern advancement. Urban planning that involves zoning regulation can help designate areas for historical preservation while allowing newer construction in appropriate uh, places. Like the old library near my home has been repurposed um, as a community meeting hall in recent years. In your opinion, how do environmental policies in cities impact the quality of life for both residents and visitors? Environmental regulations such as promoting clean air and water contribute to the overall health and well-being of the population. Also, green spaces and sustainable urban planning improve aesthetics, providing recreational opportunities and enhancing the urban environment. In Ankara, uh, green spaces like city parks and even roadside trees are now strongly protected by government regulation. Reflecting on your recent visit, how could the city improve its services or infrastructure to better cater to the needs of international visitors? Um, like I mentioned in the previous part, I wasn't completely satisfied with the public transport in Istanbul. I guess to better cater to the needs of foreign visitors, Istanbul could enhance its multilingual signage and information systems, making it easier for tourists to navigate the city. Also adding more buses and vehicles, not just in peak hours, but throughout the day can make it faster to move around the city. That is the end of part three. That concludes the speaking section of the exam. You will have your mark in two days online once you're finished the other sections, and your official certificate should arrive in the mail in about 10 days. Goodbye. Sounds good. Yep. Bye. Thank you. Orkan, that was an excellent job on the uh, speaking interview. Uh, you spoke well for all three parts of the test. And um, of course, the IELTS exam, the examiners are looking for uh, fluency and coherence, grammatical range and accuracy, lexical resource, which is basically vocabulary, and then pronunciation. And really, in all of these uh, separate uh, criteria, uh, you would be scoring... 8.5 to 9 with an overall band score of 9, which means you are an expert user of the English language. Now, before we dive into a couple of points here, um, it's important for everyone to keep in mind that the IELTS exam is not a foreign language exam. It's an English proficiency exam. It's taken by native speakers and non-native speakers um, to measure English proficiency for school and for work. It doesn't matter if somebody is traveling to another country for English or if they already live in that country or were born in that country. It doesn't matter. It's a, it's a measurement. So native speakers, if they didn't finish high school English, they can also take the IELTS exam for uh, university. Um, accents aren't that uh, aren't, aren't bad. So different. There are lots of different native speakers of English in Scotland, Ireland, uh, Australia, Canada, East Coast, West Coast accents. So uh, people speak English around the world with different accents, native and non-native. It doesn't matter. What's important is can the examiner clearly understand you? That's what they're paying attention to. And in this case, Orkan, I absolutely understood what you were talking about. Fluency. Um, is also interesting. I think your fluency score would certainly be 8.5 to 9. Um, a lot of um, candidates uh, confuse f um, the speed of discussion with fluency. So they believe that they need to speak fast um, to get high scores. Um, it's not about speaking fast or slow. Natural human speech has a wide range of um, speed. Fluency relates to continuous, coherent 
communication. That's why in the IELTS marking criteria, they group these two together. They group coherence and fluency because it's not about talking really fast. If I'm talking really fast, but I don't make sense, I'm not really coherent and it's technically not really fluent either. It's just rambling. Um, when my language is broken and it's difficult to follow what I'm saying because there are awkward pauses or unnatural pauses, then that's not fluent. That will be a band five. But here, Orkan, with uh, your language, it was very clear that you were able to maintain your sentences, your ideas, and you clearly and fluently um, spoke in all three uh, parts without getting stuck for language like grammar or vocabulary or for ideas and this is where you know a lot of candidates have trouble is they don't realize it's not just about english fluency but it's about thinking fluency so being able to think continuously as you're answering and there are of course strategies and and uh tips to overcome that like asking for time or a natural filler like saying um or uh, using an expression like uh, well uh, in my opinion which assist that thinking fluency or can your vocabulary outstanding without a doubt um, use of professional natural English use of colloquial slang English idiomatic English it's present throughout the interview um, there are some um, very good examples uh, of um, of that and uh, we'll highlight those specifically in the video description and even give some definitions uh, for that uh, vocabulary um, for part two, uh, the response was well structured, well detailed, um, it was original, answered all the questions on the card. Do you have any questions or kind of about this interview, about your responses or about these scores? Okay, maybe one thing that, you know, uh, some teachers on YouTube, they say that you don't need to cover all the bullet points. So you have to talk about the, the question. And the blue points are there to guide you, to help you. They're not a requirement. So what do you think on that? I think it's honest, but bad advice. Yeah. And we're actually going to have a video on that very soon, which is true, but bad advice. <laughs> um, this is one of the uh, true, um, but bad advice to students for multiple reasons. The questions are made on purpose. So those people who are making the IELTS exam, they don't just accidentally put those questions together they have purpose and you can often um, see this in the very last question on the cue card the very last question is often quite a unique question um, in this case I believe it was um, what did you like about the city and what would you change the reason the examiner or this I should say the test builder who's different from the examiner has included this question is because this question is intended to elicit um, conditional type language so what would you change yeah. is created because they're hoping that the uh, candidate will use expressions like you did where you said uh, if I had the chance to change one part of Istanbul it might be the public transportation so it it elicits this advanced conditional grammar by answering that question so those questions on the cue card you don't have to answer them uh, as a candidate, but it's a very good idea to answer them because that's how you stay on topic. That's how you avoid repetition of ideas. That's how you are encouraged to express um, uh, complex, so grammatical range. Remember, that's one of yeah. the criteria, grammatical range. So um, again, just to circle back of, with uh, what I started, it's true, but bad advice. Uh, candidates should strive to answer those questions, even though it is just a guide. Okay, that makes sense. Yep, thank you. Okay, great question. All right, Orkan, um, again, Excellent job. I commend you for all the hard work and effort uh, that you've put into uh, reaching this level of not only English, but communication. Because again, keep in mind, everybody, that to get band eights and nines, it's not simply about good English, about vocabulary and grammar, but it's also about communication skills. And communication skills emphasize coherent, accurate language. So paying attention to the questions, giving the right or acceptable answers 
with a good amount of explanation, logical explanation, and the odd, clear, real-world example. So again, good job, Orkan. Yeah, thank you. Orkan, you have recently achieved that highly respected and coveted band nine uh, perfect score on the IELTS speaking exam. Could you say a few words about this experience for you? Well, it was a really big challenge. I really needed that score because I just couldn't imagine myself scoring something else because I wanted to start my IELTS course and to make my course a household name, if you will. I really needed a high score uh, from speaking, and I think that had to be a nine, you know. But it was very challenging. I had to work for months, you know, usually um, between 2.5 and 3 hours on a daily basis just on the speaking section. And I think it really paid off, and I'm really happy about that. Could you recount um, the actual day of your exam a little bit? So, I mean, when was it? Um, how did you feel on that day? Where did you go? How did you feel about the examiner, the test center? Take us with you on that journey a little bit. So the day of your speaking test. Well, uh, it was on the 5th of March. Um, and before my test started, I was lucky that it was at 5 p.m. So I think it was God's grace that I asked the test center if they could give me a room to prepare for my exam. And I spent like, again, two or three hours to prepare for my exam, speaking to myself and revising the topics that were the most challenging for me, such as home and accommodations. And then the examiner, he was quite um, friendly, I'd say and I didn't see anything negative about him, and that really made me uh, very confident. And I wasn't really nervous. I wasn't, I didn't really uh, feel anything negative. It was pretty smooth. So uh, just to uh, capture what you said there, you showed up early to your exam clearly very early <laughs> by what you just said and um, if i'm not mistaken they were able to provide you with a room to study on your request yes i they were uh, that was so nice of them you know i took it at my local idp center so it was called Bartson. it's located in baku azerbaijan where i'm currently living and they have always been kind with me because i've attended all of a lot of child exams at that center. They all they also have a child center, child exam center. So yeah, and I think that really played a big role. And I, I even asked them to do uh, one more speaking trial before I attend my real exam. You know, yeah. You know the Great. the real exams are really expensive, so uh, I didn't want to take it again. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, um, IELTS has a massive impact on a person's future trajectory, whether that's building an IELTS course, becoming an English teacher, going to university, immigration, or for many of those other purposes IELTS is used for. Um, it has a big impact, and, and it's very important that um, uh, candidates uh, take the exam, of course, seriously, prepare early, and um, you know, invest into their studies uh, financially, time-wise, whatever that may be. But it's very important to structure and and to be efficient. And it definitely sounds like you had all those pieces um, in place. One aspect of your communication, and when I speak to you, you know, I definitely feel like I'm speaking to a very intelligent. Uh, man using English effectively and proficiently. Uh, what becomes apparent for me during our communication is that you have a, a real sense of patience and calmness about you. You're very composed. And um, certainly this plays a, a pivotal role in 
uh, quality communication and in getting those band 7.589 uh, scores. A lot of candidates, of course, are quite nervous um, during their interview. And uh, to me, it seems that uh, you weren't overly anxious during your interview, as you aren't in this interview. Can you give a, or can you say a few words of how you maintain your composure so well? Um, well, I think religion plays a big role in making me a patient, calm uh, person. You know, um, I really love engaging in uh, religious studies, praying to God. You know, uh, I try not to uh, rely on my own understanding since it's very limited, but rely on God's understanding since it has no limits. You know, I constantly pray to God that God uh, show me the way what I should do, you know, what materials I should consume, uh, how I should practice, how much I should practice. And he's guided me real well. And also when I take the exam, I pray to God that God take care of this. It's not about how much I know. It's not about how good I am. It's all about you. If you want, I will succeed. If you don't want me to succeed, then I will fail. You know, that's quite uh, interesting. Um, as most of our viewers know, we don't usually digress into such topics. Nevertheless, I, I am a firm believer that um, um, whether it's religion, regular exercise, healthy eating, and better said, a combination of these, um, these are what we could call the external influences in the way that we are and the way that we perform. And, and it's extremely important for the IELTS exam. So beyond the um, specific direct, you know, studying of the test, doing those mock exams, um, life choices uh, will certainly have a big impact um, on um, how we perform and, and what those numbers will show uh, when that email arrives uh, from the IDP or British Council and that certificate gets into the mail. Orkan, um, a big thank you uh, for your insights and for sharing your valuable knowledge. I greatly appreciate it and I wish you the best um, in your future endeavors and projects with your IELTS course and your teachings. Uh, I'm sure we can share at some point uh, some details in the description of this video yeah. um, so that if uh, viewers so choose, they might be able to get a hold of you and um, um, maybe uh, seek your assistance if you're okay with that. Yeah, that's totally fine. I'm always ready to lend a hand for those in need. Um... Awesome. Orkan. Have a great rest of your day, and we look forward to speaking with you again. Yeah, thank you. Goodbye. Thank you for giving me this chance. Thank you for having me. Yep. Bye for now. Subscribe to our channel. Click over here. Watch another video. Click right up here. And click our IELTS Hero to join our premium package and get access to all of our videos, practice exams, and a fully interactive course.